Welcome once again to the Preparing for the Time of Trouble seminar series. This is part five, which is a bonus section. When this seminar was presented in churches, it was done in a two Sabbath in a row seminar series with a worship hour presentation and a two o'clock in the afternoon presentation. Uh, so the first Sabbath was uh, part one and part two, and the subsequent Sabbath was part three and part four. When this presentation series was done at Washington Camp Meeting, the opportunity was there for five parts because it was Monday through Friday. And so this is part five, which previously was not part of the church version. So thank you for joining, and uh, we will proceed. This particular segment is about what you can do now after you have seen this big picture of some of the future events, some of the physical and political dangers that are around us, uh, how many things could fall apart uh, in our country and life as we know it could change and or we know prophetically that we are facing at some point in the near future possibly the time when if we're faithful we won't be able to buy or sell. So with either of those scenarios life as we know it will change forever. So now that you've got this big picture and you're a bit overwhelmed with what all our options and ideas a person can say but where do I start? What can I do right away? What can I do inexpensively? So that's what this seminar is about. In our camp meeting version of this, the Monday presentation, which again would have been the first worship hour in a church presentation, was the spiritual lessons about the two times of trouble. In that we learned that uh, there's an unprecedented time of trouble ahead. There are two times of trouble, the little time of trouble, which is a time when we won't be able to buy or sell, and it would be to our advantage to live in the country and be sustainable from the uh, things that we buy uh, from the system right now. The second time of trouble is Jacob's time of trouble, and this is a time when there's no preparing outside of spiritual, and you don't even grab your coat. You just flee. God will feed us with the ravens. Our bread and water will be sure. Two completely different times of trouble. The second segment, which in the camp meeting version was Tuesday, and in the church version is the first Sabbath afternoon, is urban dangers and the life and the end of life as we know it. In that we learned that life as we know it will change, that there are danger signs of what's coming, and we reviewed how worldly people are preparing. They're called preppers. They are uh, collecting food and packing up guns, and it will be survival of the fittest in their view. And we also compared what we've learned about the Christians' preparations that can be done, which are a world apart from the preppers. The third segment is the loud cry and warning the cities. Um, that also would have been the second Sabbath in a church scenario. In that we learned that um, Sunday laws will result in the shaking. The mark of the beast results in no buying and no selling. The latter rain results in the loud cry. The loud cry is the last warning to the world, particularly those in the city. Uh, the seeds that we sow now could very well result in the great harvest at that time. Thousands will be converted in a day, and God will pour out his judgments upon the cities. The previous seminar, which was on Thursday in the camp meeting version, or the last session for a church version, is preparing for independence and sustainability. In that, we learned how to be sustainably independent of public services, how being situated to be able to reach out to others during the little time of trouble would be advantageous, if we can't take care of ourselves, we won't be able to have time to help other people. So being positioned to be more independent of the worldly services allows us to be sustainable 
during this difficult time, and that affords us the ability to be helpful to others. Um, I also give a, gave a handout of valuable resources and free online materials. By the way, if you're watching this online, the handouts are available at the bottom of the screen. They are PDFs that can be printed out. The advantage of the uh, PDF version is if you open the PDF resources sheet on your computer, the links will work and you won't have to type them in like if they were on a printed version. <clears throat> so today's bonus presentation, uh, which again is typically not in a church presentation, but is um, uh, the fifth of the seminar series that was done at the camp meeting presentation, is what can we do now? So what we're going to learn today is the first steps uh, in preparation. What can we do? What are the steps? What are short-term things we can do? What are longer-term things we can do? But particularly short-term. There's, there's different kinds of preparation. There's mental preparation, things we can learn. There's physical preparations. There's things we can do. There's spiritual preparation, which are connecting with God and with other people. So today's topic is, what can we do right now? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we have been learning about your uh, Bible's uh, in, in representation of what we can expect between our time and when Jesus returns. We so eagerly look forward to his return, but we also know that there are some very troubling times ahead. Thank you that you've given us these insights and that we can learn from them and that you give us opportunities to do some preparation so we thank you for that, and in Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs 22 says, A prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions, while the simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Every earthly support will be cut off. We've studied that previously here. Last Day of Events, one of our little textbooks says on page 148, In the last great conflict, in the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy, and buy or sell. Amos 3 says, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants the prophets. Now the following are my words. As Christians, we have been warned about the future, so we can be prepared and take appropriate precautions. Therefore, rather than going blindly on, if we are prudent or wise, we will study the prophecies to see what lies ahead, and then, based on what we've learned, we will take precautions in accordance to God's Word. Country Living, one of our other little textbooks, says... The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future, what will soon come upon them in blinding force. We must be preparing for these issues. So what can we do, what can we do now? The first thing we'd like to look at is, is steps that can be done right away in preparation. Uh, Country Living says, I see the necessity of making haste to get all things ready for the crisis. So I suggest your first steps would be to make a list. If you make a list of things that you think you would want to accomplish, things you would want to purchase when you could afford them, things you'd want to learn, things you'd want to uh, do, uh, and of course the big decision is do I want to relocate to a safer place. Then you take this list and you prioritize it. In our particular case, our, my wife and I and our daughter and son-in-law were together wanting to make the, go on this journey, and so we each made a list, and then we compared our lists, and of course they were different, and then we prayed about it and worked together until we came up with a list that matched as a unit. And we prioritize them according to what's most important. For instance, 
our son-in-law's employment. He would be relocating from one state to another. He's an engineer, so many people make the mistake of moving out into the country without making employment a top priority. So we had that as a high priority. Um, and another priority was our daughter wanted to be able, she has young children and wanted the option to be able to um, um, enroll her children when they were of that age in a Seventh-day Adventist Christian school. Well, some of the remote areas don't have one, or it might be very small, and one might wonder if by the time these children are old enough to go to school, whether that school would be there. So a priority for her was to be within a commute distance to a dependable uh, Adventist school. Um, my wife's issues were that she has some allergies to dust. And even though she doesn't have an allergy to dust from a road, if we lived on a gravel road for a long ways, that dust might eventually become an allergy for her. One of the issues I was concerned with was the danger of wildfires. And a lot of people that choose to live in, say, eastern Washington or northern Idaho are in more danger of a wildfire uh, in a remote area than um, we might be on the west side of Washington State. Um, so these are just some examples of things that as we made our list and prioritized them and negotiated among the, the, the shareholders of this venture, uh, we came up with a list and then one step at a time we started to analyze these items and start to make movement. Um, remember one step at a time. This can be really overwhelming. It doesn't need to be. Uh, there'll be enough stress in trying to implement change that no need bringing on extra stress by being overwhelmed by so many options or so many things a person might want to do. I'm the kind of person that I like to dream big and take on lots of things and sometimes that can backfire and make a person overwhelmed. So take a breath, do one thing at a time, and just ha knock them off the list as you go. In the meantime, you're keeping an eye on the long-term goal. In our case, the long-term goal was to relocate ourselves so that we would be in a location, in an environment where we were more in the country, more able to sustain ourselves, firewood, surface water on the property, um, various things that uh, garden that would help us to be able to sustain, sustain ourselves during difficult times. Country Living again says, If in the providence of God we can secure places away from the city, the Lord would have us do this. There are troublous times before us. Let everyone take time to consider carefully and not be like the man in the parable who built, who began to build and was not able to finish. Not a move should be made, but that movement and all its portents are carefully considered, everything weighed. There may be individuals who will make rush, make a rush to do something and enter into some business they have know nothing about. This does, God does not require. Think candidly, prayerfully, studying the word with all carefulness and prayerfulness, with mind and heart awake to hear the voice of God. To every man was given his work according to his several ability. Then let him move hastily, but not hastily, but firmly, and yet humbly trusting God. I'd like to sidestep for a minute and address this first half of the sentence. To every man was given his work according to his several ability. Sometimes when people... Uh, attend a seminar like this, they can be overwhelmed and say, but I, I could never do this. For instance, you might be an, a, an older single woman, maybe on a fixed income, and you would say, you know, I live in a rented space in the city, and I couldn't possibly go and find 20 acres and build a house and build a garden and all those things. Well, that's true. 
And I think it's important for each of us to consider our current environment, our current situation, and make our plans to make a country move based on the abilities of that level of uh, affordability. For instance, if you are renting in the city, it's very possible that you could move to the country and rent for less money. Um, that doesn't mean if you rent and you have a fixed income that you that God expects you to go and buy 20 acres and build a house. That's unrealistic. Now, that doesn't mean God might not provide you something like that, but don't be overwhelmed that that option seems to be the only one. It's not the only one. One of the families in the video clips I showed earlier um, shows uh, a black family that were in the snow throwing snowballs and saying how they enjoyed it. You might remember that clip. Those folks were able, the Lord provided them a, a country home for free. All they had to do is house sit. Um, the other gentleman that was standing in the snow, the, the Caucasian gentleman that was talking about he wanted to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. At the time he made that video, he was renting. Dave Westbrook, who you saw several times, who was in the news clip and all of that, they were renting part of the time when that was done. So you need to look at your situation and think of a lateral move in where you're you're doing the same thing but you're moving to the country so that makes it a lot less overwhelming than thinking that god expects you to go from a fixed income to renting and you're going and building this great big thing if if you're elderly there's limitations if you have financial constraints there's limitations so the question also might be asked what happens if i'm in those scenarios well I personally don't think that God expects, you know, an elderly person to be able to start over and, and build a house and, you know, chop firewood and all that stuff. But I think there will come a time where it will be advantageous for people to pool together where you, you're not doing it alone. And you have like-minded people that live maybe near each other and you can help each other because everybody has some kind of strength, some skills, some financial abilities that are different than the other people. And if you can get people together that can get along, that have like-minded goals, then maybe, maybe they can do it by helping each other. Just something to think about. To every man was given his work according to his several ability. Then let him not move hastily, but firmly, yet humbly trusting God. So irrespective of our financial situation, of our all those things, God still wants us to try to move forward. The next category is short-term preparation. What can we do now with our long-term goals in mind? We can start with what we can do now. And I would like to suggest... The first thing we could do is do research. This costs nothing. If you have access to the internet, or if you don't, you can go to the public library and use their computers and get on the internet. But get on the internet. There's a world of opportunity of things to learn, um, practical things. You can just pick any item on your, on your wish list and you can learn. So let's say, for instance, you're, you don't know anything about uh, solar energy energy to, to generate some electricity. Um, there's lots of YouTube videos, lots of resources, websites where you can learn for free and see what other people have done and start to learn that kind of thing. And so little by little you can add to your library of things that you know how to do intellectually. And I'd like to uh, uh, suggest a little later here that how you can organize it, but we'll get to that. So you're researching, you're learning, you're planning what you're going to do with what you're learning. You might be collecting some things along the way, some affordable things, and we'll talk about some of those that are even free here pretty quick. So um, mental preparation is the learning part. And I'd like to suggest some resources that you might purchase 
a little miniature library of some things that would help you uh, in a difficult time. So let's say you no longer can buy or sell or the grid goes down and there's no electricity and now you, now the stores don't work, etc. Um, it would be nice to already own a pocket-sized Bible. Now my Bible is a pretty big Bible and uh, you know I'm I'm not planning to get rid of my big Bible because it's pretty, I have a lot of notes in it but the a pocket-sized Bible would be very handy if you needed to relocate and you need to put it in a backpack and and go for a walk or or get relocated or something like that something more temporary so a pocket-sized Bible is useful and and our little books that we've used as uh, textbooks for this program this seminar is all are also good last day events is one of those uh, another idea is a wild edible plant book um, they're not expensive and it's quite a fun little hobby to go out in the woods and and look around and see what you can figure out that's edible um, wilderness survival book uh, they make books about how to you know, live off the land, how to build a, ca a shelter, how to start a fire, those kinds of things. And I would also like to suggest a, a new book by Daniel Knopf that is on the Sabbath. We know that the Sabbath is going to be one of the issues when it comes to the mark of the beast and not being able to buy and sell. So it would be advantageous to learn as much as we can about the Sabbath, the history of how it got changed, and so forth. Uh, this is the most thorough book that I've ever seen on this subject. Um, I had the privilege of reading it before it went to print, and uh, it's a really great book. It's, it's a book that is uh, a simple read and yet very documented. And so it, it's a book that could be used to share with a friend. Uh, it's not scholarly, but it's very scholarly in how it's documented. So whether the person is just a casual reader or whether they're a scholar, this book would be really great. It's called uh, Sacred Time Unremembered by Daniel Konoff. Okay, there are some free resources, lots of them. YouTube videos are free, and there are lots and lots and lots of them. Who knows how many of them? But you pick a subject, you do a search for them. If you Google search, you can find the subject you're looking for. There are also Internet websites on these kinds of topics. Um, and it's important when you collect this information that you organize it in some way. <clears throat> I'd like to take a minute and address that. I'm a paperless person. I teach online. Everything I have is in my laptop. I don't use paper. I don't, I don't have student names on paper. I don't grade physical papers. They're on the computer. When I am researching these things having to do with being prepared for the time of trouble, I don't write them down. I put them in a Word document. So I have folders on my computer for all the different subjects that we've been talking about. And within those folders are individual documents of keeping track of things. So let's use exa the example of the solar energy again. <clears throat> when I, I, have a sh I have a page in the solar energy, in the alternative energy folder, I have a folder for solar energy. And in that folder, I have a Word document that is a list of links of useful things that I have found on the subject, uh, including YouTube videos. So my way of being organized is to have it all on the computer. Now you can see the problem with my method, and that is if I don't have electricity for a long time and my batteries go dead, my computer doesn't have that information for me anymore. So there is a risk by me doing that this way. By comparison, my wife is the opposite. She will watch a video on, say, gardening, and she will methodically take notes, putting it on pause, taking notes. And she then will take these handwritten notes, and she'll type them into Word documents, which she will print out and put them in three-ring binders. So she's got all of her uh, things that she's been learning documented in print, so if the computer is not available, she can still use the printed ones. 
So there's some examples of ways to get organized. Do it your own way, whatever works for you. Then there are invaluable skills that you can enhance by learning. First of all, survival skills. Um, happens to be a subject I've been interested in for a long time, ever since I was a teenager. And so, um, to me, if I was out in the woods, I'm not afraid. Um, I, I, don't, I don't fear any animal in western Washington. I don't, uh, I, I think that I can survive uh, and food and shelter and all of that kind of stuff. But that may not be an area that you're very familiar with. So I would suggest that if not, then you would learn what you can and practice and do some things, you know, how to build a fire, how to build a shelter, you know, whatever so, uh, survival skills that, that you may need to enhance. Another area that are invaluable skills is gardening. Now, gardening doesn't happen to be a thing that I'm very knowledgeable about, um, I have a bad back, and so bending down pulling weeds is not my idea of having a good time. My wife, on the other hand, loves gardening. She loves to be in the dirt. It, she's just totally happy being in the garden. So she's very knowledgeable in the gardening, and I'm very knowledgeable in wilderness survival, and so we can complement each other. Um, building maintenance and repair skills. Uh, if you're out in the country, you've got things to do, build, to fix, maintain and that happens to be an area that for the most part I'm pretty good at so again these are some areas that you can consider that you could for free um, research on the internet you could uh, you know have a friend that has strengths in those areas maybe educate you on how to keep your car running or whatever all right the next area is physical preparation what can I do well let's talk about some storage. Uh, this is free. You can collect water in some old containers that, uh, that you've emptied um, and store it. And um, as you get to being doing this, it would be nice to have enough water to get by for at least a few days, maybe a couple of weeks. But as we learned earlier, you can't live very long without water. So water is really important. And especially if you're in a dry, more desert kind of environment. So one thing to keep in mind about storing water is there is a certain type of plastic jug that is not intended for long-term storage in water. And those are becoming, I don't recall the name of it, but it's becoming pretty popular to have the containers that you buy water in to be the right kind. Um, and the, the wrong kind are getting harder to accidentally have. So if you, you know, if you have containers that you can store water in, um, it's a good idea to have some around. And then maybe once every six or eight months you could rotate the water, dump it out, and fill up some fresh water, but in general it'll it'll be fine indefinitely. Now this is a little more sophisticated. These are five gallon jugs that are made to store water long term. And some of them, when you use them, you can tip them up on their side and it has a faucet. And so it makes it real handy for doing it. What about food? <clears throat> um, here are some examples of pre-made meals that are intended specifically to be long-term storage for emergencies. Um, Costco sells these. Um, these are 700 meals in, in approximately five gallon buckets. They look a little taller than that. that. They sell for $199 for one pail and that's 700 meals. They're all vegetarian and that's three meals for a dollar. That means a meal is 33 cents. You can't make your own meal for 33 cents. So that's a really good buy, and it's made to store, and if you leave it in the container, it can last for 20 years. Now, I'm not saying that 33-cent meals are going to be wonderful, you know, you eat it as a steady diet, but in an emergency situation, you're not, you're not there to have a gourmet meal, you're there to have survival. Preparing meals from the Deluxe Survivor 700 is easy. All you need is a little water, a heat source, and your choice of meal pouch. 
Cooking times may vary from one minute for oatmeal to about 25 minutes for dinner entrees with a little stirring required. Instant milk and instant orange drinks are as easy as mixing the contents of the pouch with water. Food for Health products are packaged in Mylar pouches designed to protect from the harmful effects of air, light, and moisture, increasing shelf life up to 20 years. Unused pouch contents can be stored for up to a year after opening. Food for Health International food storage solutions make it easy to provide healthy, nutritious, and delicious meals to your family for everyday meal planning or in case of an emergency. Here's another example of a commercially made long-term storage food. This is available at Walmart. It's 543 servings. Um, if it's it's for it will last a month for one person. It's $144. It's all vegetarian and it will store for 30 years. But some of you may uh, like our family not be so interested in buying prepackaged meals. If you're a TV dinner kind of family, then the prepackaged meals may be something you'd like. If if you're more of a scratch cook kind of a family, then this approach might be more for you. These are bins that store dry legumes um, and different grains and things that certain things can be stored this way and don't need refrigeration. And they, the, you can purchase these containers with these lids. They're specifically made for storing those kinds of things. You would want to do some research about what can get stored and how to go about it because there is the concern of some things can go bad if there's oxygen in the container. There's also the, the fear of some bugs getting in, and it's beyond me how the bugs can get in with an airtight container, but apparently they can. And so some people say, you know, put something in, a bay leaf maybe or something. So you need to do some research, but in general, there are a lot of dried things that you could put in storage containers and not have to refrigerate them. Another option would be uh, to go real cheap would be to just use old pop bottles and you can store some of those same things in there and not have to spend the money uh, right away for the containers. <clears throat> um, what about seeds? Now, if you can't buy or sell, that means you can't buy seeds. And the problem is companies like Monsanto have got our culture to where everything is crossbred and hybrid and and, you know, if you've got, um, say, corn, I don't know if that's a good example, but if you've got some vegetable that you like that is, that is a, you know, tampered with GMO kind of a plant, if you save seeds from it for the next year and you plant it, they either may not grow or they may try to revert back to the three or four different plants that they were crossbred from and you get some really weird plants that could be questionable. So the solution to that is heirloom seeds. These heirloom seeds are not crossbred. They're, they are gathered from themselves and used year after year. Uh, the Bible even talks about this approach because it talks about taking the very best of a crop and saving it for the next year. And this is what the old farmers used to do. So if you had uh, a particular vegetable and then there are, you know, half a dozen really nice ones, you would, instead of eating the nice ones, you would save them salvage the seeds, dry them out, and save them so the next year's crop would be based on the best of the best. So there are companies that sell these seeds, and this one is just one. And heirloom seeds can be stored um, either in the packages when you buy them, or you can put them in here. Here's an example. There's popcorn and some other things in jars. Um, <clears throat> another thing uh, to consider, let's say you live in an apartment and you have a balcony and you don't have any garden space. You can still learn how to garden by using the Mitleider method. Uh, Mitleider was an Adventist gentleman who uh, 
developed this method of gardening, and he would he would travel around through his life to different Adventist mission schools or stations or whatever, and teach them how to be highly productive with their methods. Now, Mr. Mitleider has passed away, and um, another gentleman has um, carried the torch. Dr. Jacob Mitleider was the originator of this, a Seventh-day Adventist, but this friend of his is, was, is a Mormon, and the Mormon has picked up the torch and promotes the Mitleider method. And, and I'm happy to say, with him continuing to carry the torch, he doesn't claim credit to himself, and he freely talks about how it started with an Adventist and, and what, what he did historically. So you might want to research the Mitleider method, um, and they have, you know, books and DVDs and things like that. Now here's an example of an heirloom uh, tomato plant. Um, our son um, decided to experiment with tomatoes with heirloom seeds. So he bought heirloom seeds, which again are not the crossbred GMO kind of things. And uh, <clears throat> he put them in uh, five-gallon pots on his patio. You can see there's no ground there. It's just gravel and slab floor for the patio. So he planted these in pots and irrigated them and stuff. Well, one of the tomatoes fell off onto the gravel. And the seed from the tomato, from the heirloom tomato, planted itself in the gravel. And you're looking at that plant that he did not plant, that planted itself. He called it Hercules. This thing was a monster. You can see the five-gallon bucket in the corner. That's how little these things were. And this one that he didn't even try to do anything with went bonkers. And you can see, if you look close, there's a red tomato on it. So it's kind of exciting to play around with this. And I thought I'd show you that picture. Now let's get away from water and food. And let's talk about electricity for a bit. If either the grid went down or you couldn't buy or sell, so much of what we have is dependent on electricity that it might be a good idea to have some backup method of being able to generate electricity. In our particular case, we bought this uh, solar panel kit from Harbor Freight. Harbor Freight is uh, a guy's favorite store where tools and stuff like that are all made in China and they're real cheap. Well, they sell this solar kit and I want to say it was like $170. And it's three solar panels and the rack to mount them and all the electronic stuff that goes with it. It even comes with some, some light, blow, light bulbs and adapters to plug in different things. And uh, we're just leaving it in the box and just storing it. And then if someday we need an emergency way to have a little bit of electricity, this will be our option. Now, it didn't come with a power inverter that was big enough to do everything we wanted so from Harbor Freight we bought this one for like 15 bucks and this is big enough to run say a television for instance so um, between the two we have some potential you would need a battery uh, like a marine battery an RV battery a boat battery those kind of things deep cycle battery if you wanted to store the electricity if on the other hand you just want to use what you get then you could use it say to charge some some batteries or or run something but there is an advantage in being able to store because if you want a light and it's dark the solar panel is not going to work when it's dark so that could either be one of those car size batteries that's a deep cycle battery or it could be like flashlight batteries that get charged during the day and then at night um, they work so Again, this system is not a lot of electricity, but it does give you an idea of some fairly inexpensive thing that you could do to get started. So then I went to Harbor Freight and I said, okay, I, I got a free flashlight from them. They give them away periodically, but it has like four little AAA batteries in it. And so, and it's LED, so it's really efficient. I thought, okay, but I've still got to be able to charge the batteries if I don't have electricity. So again, for about 15 bucks, I got this household battery solar charger. It's a self-contained little solar panel uh, with places to put a variety of sizes of batteries. So even without that big setup, for just a few bucks, you could buy this little handheld thing, you could set it in your window, put it outside, 
put your batteries in it and it will charge the batteries no wires or anything so you could have flashlights or whatever emergency things that were going to require batteries now we talked earlier about an EMP electromagnetic pulse where um, you know say a ter it could be a solar thing from the Sun but more than likely it would be some terrorist uh, trying to do damage you saw earlier in the presentation that um, it is in every country's war game plan that the first thing they do is do an EMP because then it cripples the infrastructure of that country you might recall when the US and the Allies attacked Iraq to uh, try to free the Iraqi people from Saddam Hussein and the supposed uh, wars of mass destruction which never appeared uh, the first thing they did is they took the stealth jets which nobody had ever seen yet and which were elusive to radar and they flew in at night and then they ran these smart bombs and they went right down the vent pipe into their command center their control center that did all the communication so this the very first thing that happened is all of a sudden they had no communication so it, it crippled their ability to function similarly the modern day war strategy of people that want to do us harm is to start out with an EMP so they blow off this small atomic bomb 100 miles above the earth or so above the United States and it would potentially take out the grid and as we saw earlier that means that you know of the 12 or so substations that we have that are important to the backbone of the grid um, those pieces of equipment aren't made in the United States and it's a two-year waiting list so if the grid goes down we're in big trouble and so the thing that starts it is the EMP so an EMP you don't feel it you don't see it and it's just like a big magnetic field blast of high voltage as I understand it well that damages all the microelectronics and virtually everything we have is microelectronic control little miniature computers and stuff so there are different theories of how to protect yourself your your not yourself it doesn't hurt you but the, to help to protect critical pieces of electronics that you don't want to get damaged for instance what if you have an emergency radio uh, we bought a little red cross radio it has a hand crank on the side I've seen one with a solar panel on it so in an emergency you could listen to shortwave or a, you know emergency broadcast system or something but if if it's sitting out in the house and there's an EMP that radio is toast we assume so this is the method one of the methods that I found on YouTube and actually bought a book from the guy who did the YouTube and he explains it um, this is called a Faraday cage and that's a generic term there's commercially made Faraday cages but this is the cheapest easiest buy it at a hardware store approach to being able to protect your critical little things from an EMP this Faraday cage is nothing more than a good quality 32 gallon metal garbage can with a tight fitting lid you will see that I added a copper wire between the handle on the lid and the handle on the on the can itself which is my own little extra protective measure I don't know if it'll matter but anyway made sure that they're connected now the goal is that this EMP blast of electricity goes around the can and doesn't hit anything inside so you need first of all need to make sure that inside does not touch outside so before I put any sensitive electronics in the can I need to line it with cardboard so that it is not touching the edge of the box, the, the can and you'll see I put some duct tape I did it only on the inside because duct tape can be electrically uh, conductive and so I didn't do it on the outside I just did it on the inside which isn't touching the can then this gentleman did some experimenting <clears throat> an AM radio broadcast antenna puts out a similar uh, radiation kind of thing as an EMP so what he did is he took this 32 gallon garbage can he put an AM radio inside there was cardboard inside like this and he put it next to a 50,000 watt which is as big as an AM station can get 
antenna. He's sitting right next to it with his garbage can. He has the radio tuned to the station, and he closed the lid. And if the radio quits and you don't hear any sound, then it worked, the theory is. Well, he could still hear a little bit. So he said, well, that's not good enough. So he came up with the next theory, and that is put a garbage can inside of a garbage can. So this is a 32-gallon garbage can, and I shopped around and found that a 20-gallon garbage can fits perfect. You know, by the time you have the cardboard in, even the lid fits perfect. I was really excited about that. So here you've got the big garbage can with the little garbage can. I lined it with cardboard, and then I put inside it a plastic bag with my components in it. You'll notice I put uh, cardboard on the lid as well. So here we go with the lid on top of the little can and then the lid on the big one. <clears throat> so what do you put in a Faraday cage? Obviously there isn't much room there. First of all, everything I have as you know is on my computer. So I didn't want to lose that. I had an old computer that I had replaced it with the new one. Still worked. <clears throat> So, I got an external hard drive, and I took everything off my new computer that I thought was a critical, and I put it on the external hard drive. <clears throat> then I took the power supply uh, and the computer and the external hard drive and put it in the Faraday cage. Now, we found at a trade show a guy who made this Faraday bag. It's made out of a certain kind of aluminum. And so, just as an extra precaution, I put the computer and those components into the bag and then put it into the Faraday cage. So I've got a triple layer of protection for the computer. So here's some suggestions of things that you might want to consider to put in a Faraday cage. Things that might get hurt by an EMP that you might wish you had once that happened, if it did happen. <clears throat> Some kind of radios, flashlights, power generating like the solar panel stuff I had, the inverter. Equipment. Notice notice I didn't put the solar panels in the Faraday cage. I only put the inverter because, and a couple of minor items because the solar panels will not get hurt. They don't have any microelectronics. Car repair parts, uh, computer and drive, solar chargers, medical devices, cordless tools, compact fluorescent lights. Uh, clock, digital camera, voltmeter so you can test your stuff, a DVD player and an MP3 player and it's like why would you do that? Well you know what if if life gets really primitive it might be nice to be able to listen to some music if you can't find it any other way so just some interesting things to think about. <clears throat> now let's talk about a different thing and that is emergency backpacking. Now there are two kinds of, or at least two kinds, of, of bug out bags. Uh, they call them a bug out bag because you're going to get out. You're bugging out. There's a danger coming. It could be marauding gangs, but you feel danger and you've got to get out. It could be just to get out of sight and get in the woods. It could be to get away several miles. Another name is a 72-hour bag because most of the time a bug out bag is not intended to go on a long backpack trip. It's intended to hide for three days and, and possibly come back. Another name is a go bag. And the one I like is a, is a good bag, get out of Dodge bag. <clears throat> um, again, it's only designed for three days. You customize it to what your particular needs are. And the two kinds of bags, it depends on what you're going to use it for. One is um, you're leaving for up to 72 hours, but you're coming back. Now, here's an example of that. Let's say, let's say there's an atomic blast. There's, a, there's an, a bomb that gets blown up, say, 50 or 100 miles from where you live. Um, where we live, there are military uh, things. Uh, if you want to know where there are uh, targets in the United States, um, potential targets for a bomb uh, blast. There's a book by a gentleman called Joel, uh, by the name of Joel Skousen. Joel Skousen, he has a book called Strategic Relocation. And in that book, he maps state by state where the targets and what they are. Believe it or not, Montana has a lot of them, so it's an interesting read. But anyway, um, 
So let's say there's an atomic bomb, and you, you would know it. Um, and so you've got to run. You've got to find a place to hide because if you're within 15 miles of the atomic blast, you're probably dead. But if you live 50 miles away, you're not going to be damaged from the blast, but the fallout could, could give you long-term you know, issues. It's very dangerous. You can get cancer and all that stuff. So <clears throat> if there was an atomic bomb, you'd want to, you'd want to go to a safe place. It might be an underground thing you know, whatever version it's, get out of the, get out of the, the, the air, get to somewhere hidden, a basement, whatever, um, <clears throat> as sealed up as possible. Back in the Cold War days, they were really pushing uh, fallout shelters. That's what those were. Um, so anyway, so in that scenario, you're going to run, and in 72 hours, the wind has blown that dangerous air away. So theoretically, you could come out of hiding three days later and go back home and resume life as normal. But that's, that's if your, the bug out bag is designed to come back. But another scenario is you don't come back. You're fleeing and you're never coming back. So depending on what the purpose of the bag is, it, you may have some different things in the bag depending on which scenario. Um, so whether you're staying or fleeing depends on what you want to put in the bag. A lot of it's overlap. It also needs to fit your environment. For instance, I'm in western Washington. It rains, but it's not real cold. Um, we don't have real hot, barreling down desert sun. So I'm less concerned about uh, exposure to the sun and the heat. Like if you're in the desert, I'm less concerned uh, about not having water. But I am concerned if it's raining and I want to stay dry. So a bug out bag for me would include some kind of a bisqueen or a or a poncho or something that would allow me to uh, stay dry. Uh, might have waterproof matches as well. So the the environment needs to be considered when you're developing your bug out bag. And the other thing is don't have it more than 30 pounds because if you're trying to leave in a hurry, you don't want something real heavy. And so the trick is, how do we get everything that we need in a small space? Here are the contents of my bug bag. Where's the bag? London Trading Company Ranger Backpack. Frameless. 3,000 cubic inches. Yeah. Hat. Canteen. Put the kit inside the pouch. Some food, some water disinfectant, chemical treatment, can opener on a dummy cord, stainless steel canteen cup, and a soda strap onto it so it can go over my shoulder easier to carry. Usually I just tuck it in that bag though. Folding saw, lightweight, effective, quiet if necessary. Toothbrush of course, other hygiene products. Edible wild plants. Six ways in, 12 ways out. Clear garbage bags. Trowel, silver coins more hygiene, pencils, soap, things like that, first aid kit, Canadian sewing kit, food, spices, some hemp parts in there, great emergency food, bouillon cubes, Sog Steel Pup, Cold Steel Recon, Scout, more food, dehydrated, socks, wool scarf, clean canteen, one liter, 500 mil, 500 mil I think it is actually, actually, with a filter in it so that I can scoop any water into this and then when I drink it through the outlet, it's filtered, so it's instant filter. 
mosquito jacket, which works as long as it's not touching your skin. They can still bite through this jacket though if you have it tied up against your skin. I've learned that the hard way. And there's a few more items that I'll be adding to this. So what things could go in a bug out bag? Here's just some suggestions. A sleeping bag with a pad, camouflage tarp, a small Bible, rain gear or a poncho, clothing items, water containers, water filter, food, toilet paper, toiletries, first aid kit, money, knife, flashlight, rope, fire starter, and important documents. Last of all, and most important for sure, is spiritual preparation. First of all, how can we uh, spiritually prepare? By studying God's Word, for sure. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, Study, your show self, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Matthew 10 says, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the courts, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you will speak, for I shall it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. It's a very interesting statement in the book Desire of Ages that says God's grace will be dispensed to his servants to meet the emergency. And then this quotes that, what we just read, it shall be given them, says Jesus, in that same hour what you shall speak. The servants of Christ were to prepare no set speech to present when brought to trial. Their preparation was to be made day by day in treasuring up the precious truths of God's word. The knowledge obtained by diligent searching of scriptures would be flashed into their memory at the right time. But if any had neglected to acquaint themselves with the words of Christ, they would never, they if they had never tested the power of his grace in trial, they could not expect the Holy Spirit to bring them his words to their remembrance. That's a pretty powerful thing to contemplate. So, we need to learn to completely trust God. <clears throat> Last Day Events says, if we're called to suffer for Christ's sake, we should be able to go to prison trusting in his name as a little child trusts in his parents. Now is the time to cultivate faith in God. Are you at a point in your spiritual walk where you would trust God as a little child trusts his parents if you were sent to prison right now for God's sake? Last day events continues, the time of trouble which has never was is soon to be upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess, and which many are too indolent to obtain. The best thing for us is to come close to come into close connection with God, and if he would have us to be martyrs for the truth's sake, it may be a means of bringing many more into the truth. Wow. So would, be, would we be willing to trust God enough to allow us to be face death as a martyr and know that God's will would be done even if we were to die? We also have no reason to fear. Romans 8 says, Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present or things to come, neither height, nor death, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Last day events says, We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us, and his uh, teaching in our past history. Romans 8 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 12 says, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Psalms 23, we all know, says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. 
Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Isaiah 33 says, O Lord, be gracious unto us. We've waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. He that walketh righteously, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread will be given him, his water will be sure. Daily we need to be sharing the love of Jesus. Ministry of the Cities, to the Cities, one of our little books, textbook says, In most every community there are large numbers who do not listen to the preaching of God's word, who attend any religious service. If they are reached by the gospel, it must be carried to their homes. Often the relief of their physical needs is the only avenue by which they can be approached. Unselfish love manifests manifest in acts of disinterested kindness will make it easier for these suffering ones to believe in the love of Christ. I'd like to tell you about my friend Jim Allen. Jim starts each day by praying, Lord, Bring people into our lives today that we can share the love of Jesus with in some way with no strings attached. He tells me of a time he was driving from Aberdeen, Washington to the coast, to to Westport, and there was this Mexican gentleman hitchhiking. Jim had prayed this prayer, and he felt that he needed to pick up this hitchhiker, and in his mind he's saying, but picking up hitchhikers is dangerous, And he believed that God impressed him that he needed to pick him up anyway. So he picked him up. He's driving along. He's heading to Westport. And he's having a conversation with the gentleman. And he says, well, I'd be happy to take you to your house. And the guy was really hesitant. and, uh, And Jim then realized that he was an illegal immigrant. And so... Uh, illegal alien and so he was afraid to show Jim where he lived because he might get himself and the people he lived with in trouble and Jim said uh, you know don't worry about it I'm I'm not going to turn you in if you're illegal and you know but I'm happy to take you there <clears throat> so he took him to his house and he dropped him off and the guy said thank you and he said you know I can't believe that you picked me up he says white people don't pick me up even Mexicans don't pick me up um, why did you pick me up? And Jim said, every morning I pray, Lord, bring people into our lives today that we can share the love of Jesus with in some way with no strings attached. And he said to this gentleman, he says, you are my answer to prayer. And it just blew this guy away. That's an example of Jim interacting with people in answer to his prayer that he prays every morning. <clears throat> well, one time he was praying this prayer. And somebody called up who was the mother of his son's friend or something like that. And she said, I really need you to call up my son and talk to him. He's really discouraged. Well, Jim didn't feel comfortable doing that. And so he didn't. And that night that, that he was in a custody battle, that night he killed his wife and his children and himself. Jim was distraught and he added to his daily prayer the last line and give us the courage to do what you ask. So now his prayer is, Lord, bring people into our lives today that we can share the love of Jesus with in some way with no strings attached and give us the courage to do what you ask. And Jim says he will never make that mistake again. We also need to know that God will provide You know, we hear of the ravens feeding us, and your bread and water will be sure, but how do we know? Well, I want to tell you in in my final story before we're done, and that's a gentleman by the name of Chris Farrell. And as I understood the story from him telling me this uh, some time ago, he was in in the military when Hurricane Katrina happened. He wasn't an Adventist. I don't know if he was a Christian. And uh, his regiment was assigned in hurricane relief to Bass Memorial Academy, an Adventist school in Mississippi. We always hear about Louisiana being hit by Katrina, but Mississippi was hit equally bad as well, and it just was less populated, so we didn't hear about it. So what happened is Chris 
is, is at Bass Memorial Academy, and of course they have no electricity, <clears throat> and so the academy has big coolers and freezers and stuff full of food. So they decided that what they're going to do is give it out to people in the community because everybody was in trouble. So pretty soon, day after day, people in the community would drive up their circle drive and stop and they would hand them out food. And they're doing this over and over for quite some time. And then the folks at Bass Academy realized that they were out of food. They had enough food for one more day and then they were done. They didn't have any left. So they, de they prayed about it and they decided, well, we need to keep giving it away. We, we shouldn't just hoard it for ourselves. And so that next day they gave the food away and, and ate too, and then they were out. So they prayed and they thought, okay, this is it. No more food, just like uh, Elijah and the woman with her son. They were going to eat their last meal and die, you know. So the next day, sure enough, here comes a car up the driveway. And they're thinking, what are we going to tell these people? We don't have any food. The gentleman in the car says, I, uh, I have been sent with a semi with a refrigerated trailer full of food, and we have a caravan of trucks that were sent uh, by FEMA to come and distribute it to people in Mississippi. And in the night there was a storm and a tree fell across the freeway and the only exit was to you. And I'm unhooking this truck, taking the tractor away, and we're leaving the reefer truck full of food and there are several more on their way and they will all come here. So by being selfless and sharing with others in time of need and uh, God will provide, and in this case, he provided in a miraculous way, and it impressed Chris so much that he became a Christian and became a Seventh-day Adventist and tells that story. So this is the end of this uh, five-part seminar series, Preparing for the Time of Trouble. We learned that in the first lesson that there are spiritual lessons for the two times of trouble. Second segment was urban dangers and the end of life as we know it. The third segment was the loud cry and the warning of the cities and the fourth one is was preparing for independence and sustainability and you have now completed what can i do now the bonus section that wasn't in the four-part series at churches but was in the five-part series at washington camp meeting so just like the others i'd like to end our series with these bible promises romans 12 12 says let your heart make you glad be patient in time of trouble and never stop praying. God is an ever-present help in times of trouble, Psalms 46.1. And I would like to end again with my suggestion that during these times, God offers us peace and assurance and an opportunity to prepare for troubled times soon to come. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you so much for providing us with your word, with inspiration of uh, things that we can do, things we can learn, things we can uh, study, ways that we can test you and prove you so that when times get difficult, we know that we can trust you. We know that you will take care of us. We know that even if things are very dangerous and even life-threatening, that no matter what happens, even if we go to be a martyr, that you love us and will take care of us. And and that when it if, if we... Um, suffer and if we are martyred it is because we through that influence will help to save more people so thank you Lord for this opportunity we uh, look forward to ways that you will lead us and so that we can trust you more and more these things we pray in Jesus name amen <music>